webinar series that we're doing along with um, Intellis. Uh, this first session is going to cover employment provisions of the Families First Coronavirus Response Act uh, and the CARES Act. Um, I'm going to be presenting along with uh, my colleagues uh, Ann Knuth and with uh, Suhas Shah of Intellis. Um, Suhas is a CPA and business consultant with more than 35 years of experience. He's written several books on accounting, cash flows, and ratio analysis. He is the founding partner of Intellis Advisors based in the Baltimore, Washington area and working with clients uh, throughout the Mid-Atlantic and the Midwest. Um, my colleague Ann is an attorney in Han Lozier's Cleveland office. She has more than 25 years of labor and employment law experience. She worked with businesses uh, of all sizes from small startups to large multinational corporations. Um, I am uh, an, an attorney in uh, Han Lozier's Chicago office um, and I practice mainly in the areas of uh, tax and corporate law. Um, I work with companies on business transactions and on some tax controversy matters. And I think like my colleague, I've been increasingly over the past few weeks working on matters relating to the coronavirus pandemic and some of the relief provisions that, uh, that are available. And that's what we'll be talking about today. Um, just a couple of housekeeping items before uh, we get started with the session. Um, this session is being recorded. Uh, so for anyone who would like to watch it offline later. Uh, it should be available probably in about 24 hours or so. Um, as I said a moment ago, this is the first of a three-part series. We hope that uh, you'll consider um, participating in the next two sessions, which are uh, a week from today and then two weeks from today at the same time. Um, and finally, all participants have been muted for this session. If you do have a question, you should see there's a, a little chat bubble um, at the bottom of your screen in the middle. Um, it looks a little bit like uh, maybe the text icon on your phone. Um, so if you have a question, please take advantage of that. Um, and we will do our best to you know, take a look at the questions and to try to uh, respond to them uh, during the session. We're hopefully going to leave a little bit of time at the end to answer questions as well. Um, so again, if, if you have questions, that would be the way to uh, the way to do it. And then of course, our contact information is available, and so you may uh, you can contact um, any one of us to um, with any uh, with any questions that you have about today's session. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Anne, uh, who's going to present first. And um, Anne, hopefully you can hear me. Uh, feel free to uh, to take it away. Great, thanks, Ivan. Uh, today we're going to start with talking about the emergency phase six leave. And we're having a little trouble. Maybe you can move closer to the mic. Sure, sorry. So if we have time at the end, as Ivan said, we hope to do, um, we will address questions also. Please feel free to use the chat button. So next slide, please. As I think individuals know, the Family First Coronavirus Response Act was signed into law by President Trump back in March. Um, that act actually contains two additional, two acts, the Emergency Paid Sick Leave Act and the Family and Medical Leave Expansion Act, which grants leave to employees. We're talking about that today because it is leave that is granted in compliance with those two acts for which the employer can obtain a tax credit. And if your leave is not in compliance with the act, then the tax credit is not available. So we thought it is important, although there's been a lot of material published about these two leave laws over the last few weeks, to have a base understanding of um, what the leaves entail so that employers are uh, applying properly for the tax credit. Uh, importantly, uh, these acts apply to leave that is taken between April 1st and December 31st, 2020. So for those employers who jumped in in March and granted leave early, 
that leave does not count towards the entitlements under the Act. These two leave laws apply to employers in the United States who employ in the U.S. less than 500 employees and public agencies who employ one or more employees. So importantly, when do you count or how do you count the 500 employees? First, as to when, you take account when the employee requests or needs leave. As companies' um, business operations are changing, um, both over the past few weeks and they will in the future, keep in mind that those who are over 500 employees today may actually have less than 500 employees in the future when an employee requests leave. And of course, if an employer closes, is furloughs employees, lays off employees, terminates employees, they may hire employees, reopen, and so they may find themselves above this 500 number. So it can be a moving target. Who is an employee? Employees, when you're counting 500, are those who are part-time, are those who are full-time, are those who are temporary workers who are assigned to a workplace. They are not your independent contractor. So again, unlike perhaps some other employment laws, when we're counting um, to see where we are in terms of 500, we're going to count everyone regardless of how many hours they work. And this would include employees who are on a leave of absence. They do count. Now, generally in employment law, um, a corporation and all of its offices count as one employer. But there's two concepts uh, that apply to employment law that cause us to perhaps join together or aggregate employees of two different companies or even more than two different companies. One concept is joint employer. We normally see this or most often see this in, as I've already mentioned, situations where we have an employer who uses temporary workers, those who come from a temp agency and provide services, sometimes for a short period of time, sometimes for a longer period of time. In those situations, the client employer is often the one who directs the temp worker, schedules them, um, might even maintain records, uh, makes determinations about what temporary workers they'll accept when they'll send a temporary worker back to the temp agency. And in those situations, the client employer is considered a joint employer and those temp workers, as I said, count. Um, we also have the concept of integrated employer. Now, again, this applies not only under the Families First Coronavirus Response Act, but also in um, other employment law contexts. And in this situation, you'll have two separate companies or more than that who operate um, in somewhat of an overlay or um, interrelationship of management. So for example, you may have, and we have this with several clients, a construction company that um, goes out, obtains projects, uh, places bids, but they don't employ any employees beyond maybe upper management. And the labor for those construction projects come from another company. And in fact, that other company uh, may have as its sole client um, the construction company who gets the projects. And in those situations, we often see common management in interrelationship or interdependency of operations, um, centralized control over labor relations, and, and sometimes financial control. This also might come up um, in situations where there are sister companies uh, operate manufacturing plants around a region or even the, uh, the country to take direction and control from a central office, uh, corporate office, HR, payroll, um, uh, financial decisions all being made out of that corporate office. That, that would be an integrated employer um, and the employees are aggregated in terms of counting towards the 500 employees. We turn to the next slide, please. 
Um, as I said, under the Family First Coronavirus Response Act, we have the emergency paid sick leave back. This act allows all employees, regardless of how long they've been employed, up to, up to 80 hours of leave. If the employee is unable to work or remote work for six reasons. This slide shows you three reasons. Um, and I'm hopeful as I talk through this today, you'll see perhaps some um, common sense decision making that went into account when Congress passed this law. But the first three reasons I want to talk about for the leave is if an employee is under a government quarantine or isolation order, the employee has been advised by a healthcare provider to self quarantine or the employee is experiencing COVID-19 symptoms and is taking a medical diagnosis. So as you think about those three reasons, you should notice that in all of those reasons, the employee is or may be um, uh, someone who is COVID-19 positive. Of course, we would encourage and want those individuals to, to remain out of the workplace by providing the um, up to 80 hours of paid leave, it encourages the employee to basically stay home. Um, I appreciate we have all heard with COVID-19, um, an isolation period of 14 days. 80 hours is not 14 days, but if you consider someone's normal work week or the right most common work week to be 40 hours, um, this is two weeks plus the weekends, and it should take care of the 14-day isolation period. Now, the first reason for leave, the state, local, uh, federal quarantine orders um, caused us some initial pause because it does include state stay-at-home orders. Um, however, it must be the state stay-at-home order uh, must be the reason the employee is unable to work in order for them to qualify for this leave. So, for example, in Ohio, where we have um, a state stay at home order and essential businesses are open. This means employees um, cannot rely on that order um, to refuse to come to work and receive emergency paid sick leave instead. Um, in, in the Ohio order, it does urge employees or individuals who are at risk to stay home, but it not, does not require them to stay home. So if an employee is concerned about coming into work because of an underlying health condition, they do, they do not, under the Ohio order, um, uh, mandatory stay at home, so they don't qualify for emergency paid sick leave. However, if they um, contact a health provider who advises them to stay home under number two because they're particularly vulnerable, they can qualify. Keep in mind that the orders may differ from state to state. Um, so you need to keep in mind uh, the employee or the state in which the employee is lives and to the extent they work in a different state, um, that state. And then finally, on the third reason for the experiencing symptoms and seeking a medical diagnosis, this only applies when the employee is taking affirmative steps to obtain that diagnosis. Presumably, once they obtain the, the medical diagnosis, which again, may not be a test, but may be orders from a doctor, if the doctor orders self-quarantine, they'll be in the second reason. If the doctor says, not COVID-19, you can return to work, or not COVID-19, but strep throat, then, um, or some other uh, healthcare issue, then this emergency paid sick leave would no longer apply and the employer needs to consider other forms of um, time off under its system. Now, for these three forms of leave, intermittent leave is not available unless the employee can work from home. Now, hopefully that makes sense to everyone because if we're suspecting someone is COVID-19 positive or could be COVID-19 positive, of course, we don't want them intermittently coming to the workplace. But if it is a worker who is able to work from home and is well enough to work from home, you can agree with the employee to provide um, remote work 
And then, of course, it's only the hours where the employee is not working that qualify for this leave. Now, I did say up to 80 hours of leave, that's for a full-time employee. A full-time employee is someone who's normally scheduled to work 40 hours in a week. Um, for a part-time employee, you look at what the part-time employee would normally work uh, during uh, that 80 hours or that two-week period. We can move to the next slide, please. So for these reasons, one, two, and three, the emergency paid sick leave, that is the up to 80 hours, is paid at the regular rate of pay and capped at $511 a day. So for, for those workers, uh, unless they're um, presumably white collar making over about $132,000 a year, they'll fall with under that cap. Um, also, during emergency paid sick leave, you must maintain your group health plan coverage. And then for this type of leave, the employer cannot require substitution of other forms of leave, but the employer and employee can agree. So again, this would come into play really when you have an employee who is subject to the cap and has some other form of paid leave available and they want to maintain 100% uh, of their pay. Now, I appreciate I used the word substitution here on this slide, and in hindsight, I, I believe that some people may not understand how we use that word when we talk about leave. Um, but it, it is in the same way we use it when we talk about Family Medical Leave Act. Substitution doesn't mean in place of, which again, I appreciate would be the normal understanding, but does mean it runs at the same time or concurrently. And then lastly, we need to keep in mind that state law may provide for greater benefits. And here right now, I think the only state that comes into play is New York, um, where New York does provide a COVID-19 leave and it doesn't have a cap. Um, if you can move to the next slide, now, um, here on this slide, we see reasons four and five for leave. Um, you're going to see there's not a slide that has reason number six, and the reason is because reason number six, which is uh, the Secretary of Health and Human Services in consultation with the, the Treasury Department and Secretary of Labor, is experiencing a condition that they have designated as a basis for leave. We don't have that yet. So the good news is we don't have to worry about leave number six. On leaves four and five, these relate to leave on account of an employee family member or someone with whom the employee has relationship. So on leave number four, under emergency paid sick leave, the employee would be caring for an individual who, similar to leaves one and two, is either a State, under a state, federal, or local isolation order, or who's been advised by a healthcare provider to self-quarantine. Recognize this is individual, not immediate family member. However, a person needs to have a relationship with the individual um, to, uh, at, and where there would be an expectation that um, there would be uh, a need for the employee to provide care. So in this situation, the employee is providing care, again, to someone who is either quarantined or isolated or who's been advised to self-quarantine. So again, we would not want the employee to be coming into the workplace, but if we have a remote work for this employee and the employee is able to remote work, this number four, under emergency paid sick leave can be taken intermittently. And then lastly, leave number five under the emergency paid sick leave is to care for a son or daughter if the school or place of care is closed or the child care provider is unavailable. This reason for leave is also the only reason for the Family and Medical Leave Expansion Act leave. The FMLA, or as we've indicated on the slide, FMLA plus leave is for up to 12 weeks of leave. Importantly, if an employee is 
taking time off to care for a son or daughter if the school or the place of care is closed or the child care provider is unavailable is only allowed 12 weeks total. So, um, so that these leaves may operate concurrently, or as you will see when we talk about pay, the employee may choose um, to take uh, uh, only the FMLA Expansion Act leave, in which case uh, it is still only 12 weeks. Importantly, it's not 80 hours and 12 weeks. Under the Family and Medical Leave uh, Expansion, this does apply to son or daughter, not as broad as individual as we saw for reason number four. Son or daughter is generally defined as someone who is over, I'm sorry, someone who is under 18 years of age. Um, it can be someone who is older, a son or daughter who's older, and that is if they're disabled. Um, and uh, by the way, your school is closed um, if it is only operating through um, tele, tele or remote. So um, this is the situation I think in many um, states like we have in Ohio, School is in session, but the school itself is closed. If we can move to the next slide. So for these reasons for leave, and here we have um, uh, some uh, commonness, and that's in how they are paid for reasons number four and five on emergency paid sick leave, and then for the Family and Medical Leave Expansion Act. Um, for the first two weeks of FMLA expansion, it is unpaid. After that, it is paid at two thirds the regular rate of pay, capped at $200 a day. For reason four, and reason five of the emergency paid sick, the pay is, is this similar. It's two thirds the regular rate of pay capped at $200 a day. And here we also have continuation of group health plan coverage. So in terms of how leave might work here, and this is where we have a bit of complication when we talk about reason number five on the emergency paid sick and the FMLA expansion. So in the first two weeks of the FMLA expansion, it would be unpaid. However, the employee may decide to use their emergency paid sick leave during those first two weeks, keeping in mind it's 80 hours, so if the employee would be normally scheduled to work more than 80 hours, they would still only be able to use 80 hours of emergency paid sick leave to cover the first two weeks of unpaid FMLA expansion leave. The employee may, in the alternative, decide to use company-provided paid time off to cover those two leaves and those, I'm sorry, those two weeks and save their FMLA expansion, I'm sorry, their emergency paid sick leave. Now, personally, I don't think saving emergency paid sick leave is the best idea because hopefully the employee will never find themselves or a family member exposed to COVID-19 and never need it. But it is the employee's choice on how they deal with those first two weeks of unpaid leave. After the first two weeks of unpaid FMLA expansion, um, the employer may require the employee to substitute paid leave or the employee may ask to do so. If we can move to the next slide. In terms of documentation, interestingly, the Department of Labor um, did not create a form for this other than the notice that was required to be posted. So here it is up to the employer um, as to whether it wants to create a form, um, but the employer is gonna need certain pieces of information um, for the tax credit, and the employee is required to provide the information that the employer needs for the tax credit. So here, 
frankly, the employee may make a verbal request for leave or we might know the employee needs leave. And so we could help the employee in providing this information um, or uh, getting it into a form that the employee could review and perhaps sign. Very simply, it is the employee's name, the dates for which the leave is requested, the reason for the leave, which again, we have five reasons as well as the FMLA expansion. If it is for leave number one, we need the name of the government entity that entered the order. If it's for reason number two, we need the name of the healthcare provider. If it is to, or reason number three, um, and that's all. Not, don't need documentation from the healthcare provider, just need the name. If it's for reason number four, which is the caring for an individual, if the individual is under the isolation or quarantine order, in addition to the employee's name, I'm sorry, the person's name in relation to the employee, we need the government entity. And then if it's because uh, the employee is caring for someone um, who either has COVID-19, may have COVID-19, or is susceptible, we need that healthcare provider. The employee has to make a statement that they're unable to work, which quite frankly could be as simple as, hey, I've got an isolation order because we don't have work the employee can do at home. But if we have work that would be appropriate for the employee to do at home and the employee declines that, the employee needs to explain um, how or why they can't do the telework. Can we move to the next slide? In addition, if we're caring for a child whose school is closed, you need the name and the age of the children and then identify that this, the school that's closed or the place of care or daycare that is closed. Um, importantly, um, for this FMLA expansion and the fifth reason under the emergency paid sick leave, the employee must make a representation that they will be the only person who's providing care for the child during the period of leave. And then if the child is older than 14 during the day, the employee has to, provide, has to provide an explanation for why they need to be home. That is what during the day is required of the employee such that they have to be home for their whatever 15, 16, 17 year old. So here we've talked to clients about being flexible because although in a vacuum, we may think that uh, there's only one parent needed to supervise perhaps children who are doing their schoolwork online. Frankly, I think um, depending on the age of the children and the number of children, in fact, one or more parents may actually be needed. I come from a family of five, four of us who were very close together. And I will say we were well into our teens before my parents didn't need um, uh, someone from outside the home to, to be in the home supervising us because, frankly, we had a way with four of us um, to get ourselves into trouble if left with, without some kind of adult supervision. So if we can move to the next slide. Um, a couple quick things to keep in mind before I turn over to Suhas. If you are an FMLA covered employer, you can use your FMLA paperwork um, during these two leaves, but you're not required. Um, keep in mind, however, if you don't do this, as you transition a someone who might have a serious health condition after their 80 hours of emergency paid sick leave, you are going to need to get the forms. Your FMLA uh, Expansion Act time does count towards your 12 weeks of your FMLA entitlement and vice versa. So if um, you have an employee who later on this year requests FMLA expansion leave time, you need to look back and see what FMLA time, they, regular FMLA they've taken um, under your policy. And then lastly, the key employee um, designation under FMLA applies here. So charting for FMLA covered employers, I think charting the time off and how it's paid and where it is paid is going to be very important so that you're sure to um, keep track of all time that used to pay that's made, but also the different categories. On the next slide, please. Um, on a small business expansion, this applies 
I'm sorry, for the small business exemption. This applies to companies with less than 50 employees. I think there was, when the act first came out, there was an idea that companies with less than 50 employees wouldn't need to comply with these acts. And that's very, very far from the truth. There is no exemption from the first four reasons of the emergency paid sick leave act. That should make sense to everyone because again, when we have employees who are exposed or may be exposed to COVID-19, we want to encourage them to stay out of the workplace. Rather, the small business exemption only applies to leave five under emergency paid sick leave, which is the reason for the FMLA expansion. And that's for taking time to be with a child when the school or place of care is closed or child care is unavailable. If a small business determines they're not able to provide that leave, it must be for one of the three reasons that appears on the screen and the employer must document that. This will be very important. You don't need to send the documentation in, but of course later if we have an employee who um, challenges the fact that a small business denied their leave, we wanna have an explanation um, either because based on financial obligations, staffing, um, that we appropriately just denied the leave. And then um, if we could turn to the next slide. Um, lastly, I did say that these leaves all have job restoration. It's similar to the restoration requirements under the regular FMLA leave. And that is a restoration the same or equivalent position it is possible that a company with less than 25 employees can um, uh, exempt himself from the job restoration. However, they do need to make efforts to restore the individual for a full year after either the leave concludes or 12, days, 12 weeks after the leave began. So again, it, it provides some relief for a small business with less than 25 employees, but the intent is that we try to continue during the 12 months um, to find a way to bring that employee back. And the next slide. And with this, I turn it over to Suha, who will now talk about um, the tax credits that are available to help companies fund these leads. Thank you. Good afternoon. And thanks, for it. Oh, so uh, just once this is Ivan, and, and thank you. And before we turn over, I just wanted to remind people if there are questions for uh, Ann or for Suhas as they're presenting, um, everyone has, as I said, been muted. So um, please ask your questions using the chat feature um, in the in the WebEx program, and uh, we'll try to address those you know, either as they come up or at the end of the program. Thanks. Good afternoon. Uh, so far, what has been discussed in this webinar are the obligations imposed on the employers by the FFCRA to provide sick leave and family medical leave to their employees. However, both FFCRA and CARES Act also provide certain relief to employers. Three such programs are refundable tax credit under FFCRA, refundable retention, employee retention credit under CARES Act, and deferral or delay of payment of certain payroll taxes. Next slide. Next slide. The, the, the intent behind these three programs is to help employers pay for sick as well as family leave for COVID reasons, which are mandated under FFCRA. These programs also help employers from avoiding retrenchments and furloughs and preserve employers' human capital. And lastly, these programs are also in, uh, intended to assist employers by providing them liquidity and help them preserve their financial well-being. Next slide. Uh, we're going to first, uh, next slide. We're going to now discuss uh, refundable tax credit. As discussed earlier in the seminar, 
certain employers, which meaning employers with less than 500 employees, must and are required to grant and pay for the sick leave or family medical leave for COVID reasons and pay for such leave. Refundable tax credit under FFCRA is one way government is assisting employers to pay for such sick or family medical leave. Employers that have 500 employees or more do not, cannot get this credit. This credit is available to employers that employ less than 500 employees. The credit is also available to self-employed self -employed persons. Next slide. In, adi in addition to, to the fact that only eligible employers are allowed this refundable credit, there are other conditions. Not all wages paid by, for sick leave or family medical leave qualify for refundable tax credit. The wages paid for sick leave or family medical leave would qualify only if such leave was granted between the period of April 1, 2020 through December 31 of 2020. What it means is that if, if an employer has an employee who is granted sick leave or family medical leave, let's say in March of 2020 or, or after December 2020, then the wages paid for such leave does not qualify, do not qualify for this credit. Further, this, the wages paid for such sick leave or family leave has to be for COVID-19 reasons. I had a, a situation where an employer uh, called me up and said they had an employee who requested a sick leave to take care of a pregnant wife. There was no COVID reason here. So even if this leave was granted between April 1 of 2020 and December 31 of 2020, but it was not a COVID reason, then wages paid for such leave would not qualify for this credit. This credit. Another condition that, that employers need to think about is under FFCRA, only FFCRA mandates that employer has to pay sick wages and family wages with a, with a maximum amount. In case of a sick leave, to, to take an example, in a sick, when a sick leave is granted for uh, self-imposed quarantine for 10 days, and the maximum amount per day that can be paid to that person that is required to be paid for that person is $511 per day. If employer chooses to pay, elects to pay more than $511 per day, then any excess amount paid per day would not be considered qualifying wages for the purpose of this credit. Similarly, FFCRA imposes restriction on number of days such leave must be granted. So if employer elects to pay for more days than what is required under FFCRA, then any wages paid in excess of number of days that FFCRA requires, those wages would also not qualify. Next, next slide. We're going to use an illustration to try to understand what I just said. We have, we have a situation here where ABC Corporation employs less than 500 employees. Obviously, that makes ABC Corporation eligible for this credit. Now we're going to try to figure out the amount of, the amount of wages that will qualify for this credit. In this particular illustration, there are three employees that, were, that had requested and were granted leave. First instance is of Mr. Lacey. He requested and was granted leave on March 1 of 2020 for two weeks because he was, he was experiencing COVID-19 symptoms. Now, employer can elect to pay Mr. Lacey for his sick leave, but wages paid to him would not qualify for refundable tax credit because 
this this is outside the date when credit is allowed in case of miss jane this her sick leave would qualify and, and and the amount paid to her would be would qualify for credit but the amount that would qualify for credit would be lot less than the actual amount paid actual amount paid to her is $700 for 3 weeks but the only $700 per day for 3 weeks the only amount that would qualify would be $511 for 2 weeks in case of mr smith entire amount paid to him would qualify because the number of days for what he's being paid and the amount that he's being paid is under the maximum amount next slide please so now that we understand who's the eligible employer and and how much what is the qualifying wages let's try to figure out the amount of credit an employer can get employer that pays the qualifying wages eligible employer that pays for the qualifying wages calculates the credit as follows all the qualifying wages that were paid for sick or family leave subject to the maximum amount and were subject to the maximum number of days plus employer share of medicare taxes on those wages plus health insurance cost of employer for those sick sick days are added together and that is the amount that qualifies for credit this i'm going to illustrate in the next example next slide please so if you continue with this example the company i've just added one more fact to it the company pays 20 dollars per day for per employee for health insurance so as we as i illustrated before none of the wages of mr lacy would qualify miss jane's wages that would qualify would be restricted to 5110 and case of mr smith all of his wages would qualify so that's 7110 on top of that abc corporation will incur medicare cost of 103 dollars so the medicare tax burden of 103 is added to that number of 7110 in addition, the health insurance cost of the sick and qualified sick and family leave of Ms. Jane and Mr. Smith, which adds up to another $300. So in total, ABC Corporation would get a credit of 7,530. Next slide, please. So now that we figured out how, how a this credit is available to the employer there are three methods by which an employer can recoup this credit first method is reduction of payroll tax deposit so when an employer is processing the the, the payroll employer has obligation to withhold federal federal income taxes social security taxes and medicare taxes from the employee's paycheck that amount normally is supposed to be deposited with the treasury however if the credit is if employer has granted sick leave and family leave and em, employer has approved those the credit then employer can reduce the payroll tax deposit amount that is payable by this credit and just pay the balance of it every pay period that's one method of of, of recouping the family leave and sick leave wages another way is if let's say credit is more than the payroll tax deposit that has to be deposited then employer has two choices employer can employer doesn't pay anything at the time when 941 deposit is due and when at the end of the quarter when a 941 form is uh, filed with irs at that time any excess credit in excess of 941 obligation employer can just request a refund check the quickest way of getting refund is the third method, which is advance refund. Every time when an employee employer accrues this credit because the employer has paid for the for the sick leave, the employer can re request a refund. If that credit is in excess of 941 deposit obligation, then then each pay period, an employer can file form 7200 and actually 
request a refund. So in a quarter, an employer each can file multiple Form 7200 and request the payment. So these are the two, three different methods by which an employer can claim and receive the credit. Next slide, please. I think we have to skip all the way. Uh, one more slide. One more slide. So let's just, the, the last three things about this employer tax credit that we should know is IRS is uh, revising its form 9. Wages that are, if an employer has requested PPP loan and requested certain wages uh, qualify for loan forgiveness, then the same wages cannot be used to get tax credit. And last point to be noted is when an employer is processing sick leave for the employees, employer is not required to pay social security tax on those sick wages. Let's go now to refundable retention credit. The purpose of reten uh, uh, retention credit is to maintain employment in the, in, in the country and to avoid rise in unemployment. This credit is, is available to all the employers, regardless of their size, as long as the employer is affected, uh, employer's business is affected by government ordered partial or full sh shutdown, or employer sees significant reduction its, in its revenue. All wages paid by the employers for the period March 13, 2020 through December 31 of 2020 qualify for this credit. However, per employee, the wages that qualify for this credit cannot exceed $10,000. And the credit that is available is 50% of 10,000, so it's $5,000. Next slide, please. I, what I just explained is right there on that slide. All the wages from March 13 to December 31 qualify, but per employee, the wages that qualify is, is restricted to 10,000 with 50% of that amount. So per employee, the company uh, employer can get only $5,000 credit. Next slide. Even though this credit is available to all the employers, the act differentiates between large employer and, and a small employer. For, for, for employee retention credit, large employer is an employer with more than 100 employees. A small employer is an, em is an employer with 100 or less employees. In case of large employers, the only wages that qualify for this credit are the wages that are paid to the employees that are absent from the work. With a, in case of a small employer, all wages of employees paid during this from March 13 to December 31st are qualify irrespective of whether the employee is working or not. So that's a major difference. Even though all employers are eligible for this credit, the amount of credit that an employer gets depends upon the size of employer's workforce. The, the refundable, next, next slide, please. There are certain restrictions on this refundable retention credit. To the extent that an employer gets this credit, employer has to reduce its deduction of wages on its income, business income tax return. For example, if, if an employer has incurred during the year wage cost of let's say a million dollars, and from March 13 to December 31st, if the employer has received a refundable retention credit of 50000 then wages of $1 million will be reduced by this 
In addition, this credit is not available if an employer has requested and gotten PPP loan. It doesn't matter whether the whether whether employer uh, requested forgiveness, whether employer has received the forgiveness or loan does not matter. If the employer has received paycheck protection loan, then employer cannot get refundable retention credit. Next slide. The refundable retention credit employer can claim in the same manner in which the earlier tax credit was discussed through 941 forms or through reduction of 941 deposits or immediately by filing form 7200. Next slide. The last program that we're going to discuss is CARES Act allows employers to delay or defer the payment of employers' share of Social Security taxes on wages that are paid between March 27, 2020 through December 31, 2020. Next slide, please. This program is available to all the employers irrespective of the size of the employer's workforce. And the amount of taxes that uh, employer, the taxes that an employer can delay are employer share of social security tax, which is 6.2%. It is very important to understand that. When a, when a payroll is processed, the employer deducts in federal income tax withholding, employee share of social security taxes, employee share of Medicare taxes, and on top of it, in general, employer pays employer share of social security tax and employer share of Medicare tax. The delay in the payment or the deferment of payment that is allowed is only employer share of social security taxes. The amount of deferred or delayed tax payment is allowed to be paid in two installments. Half of the delayed payment can be paid on or before December 31, 2021, and the balance deferred tax payment can be paid on or before December 31, 2022. It should, well, everyone should remember this. If a business has applied for TPP loan and then ultimately receives loan forgiveness, then business is not eligible to delay the tax payment. And I again want to emphasize that the payroll tax deferral applies only to employer's share of Social Security. It does not apply to federal tax withholding, Medicare tax withholding, or employee's portion of Social Security tax. Next, next slide explains that part. And I think this is the end of my section of webinar. Uh, any questions, Evan, Ivan? I've not seen, I've not seen any uh, questions uh, per se. Um, so now would be the time if people want to use the, uh, the chat function uh, to send around any questions that you might have regarding any of the materials. Um, as, uh, as I think um, I said at the outset, and you can see up on the screen, our, our information is available here. Um, actually, it looks like there's a, a little typo in my uh, phone number. My, my uh, telephone number is 3070, so strike that, uh, that extra three there. Um, but you have all of our contact information, emails, if people want to follow up with any of us individually um, on, on particular questions um, that you have. I think, you know, Suhas, you kind of highlighted it in your presentation just now, but there's, there's a lot of different programs and some of them are, are, you know, mutually exclusive to where if you are going to go ahead and try to uh, benefit from one, then you cannot apply uh, or benefit from another, like as, you know, as is the case with, you know, the PPP and um, some of the employment tax credits, for example. Um, 
and it's also important so, for people to uh, it is also important for people to differentiate in some programs just just the fact you getting ppp loan will restrict you and there are some programs where you are restricted when you get ppp loan and then you get loan forgiveness so right so that's that's, it, that's exactly difference. right that's exactly right although i would think that almost everyone if not everyone who is applying for a ppp loan is anticipating that they would receive some forgiveness. That seems to be sort of the, the by far the most attractive feature of that program. Um, what I, what I so have you, seen is there are what I have seen is there are certain businesses where no matter what they do, they are going to lose a lot of their workforce. For example, restaurants and such. Okay, and in some of those mm -hmm. cases, in some of those cases, PPP loan may not make any sense because they don't have any any headcount to apply for. Okay, and in those cases it's possible that, you know, other programs might work better, you know? Right, right. Well, and, and I think maybe Ann could even speak a little bit to this because I know Ann and I just talked the other day about um, a, a business where they were applying for a PPP loan and the business was actually, um, the, the workers were, were not happy about it because they realized that, that in fact, for them, being furloughed and being able to collect unemployment was actually the better deal, at least at least in the short term. Yeah. So it, 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 each case, I mean, by and large, PPP loan works, but not. I think the assumption that PPP loan is the best uh, solution is not always true. It, it depends upon facts and circumstances of each employer and the industry in which the employer is involved. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right. Well, I think we are um, we are just about out of time. Um, it doesn't look like there are questions, but certainly um, you know people are um, you know more than welcome to follow up with us individually. Um, for those who are able to participate next week, um, we are going to be talking. Uh, we've sort of alluded somewhat to the PPP loan program. Um, that program, as as many of you know. Uh, you know, initially was, you know, overwhelmed with applications. It ran out of money and uh, just uh, today apparently has been, you know, replenished with an additional $310 billion. So uh, for those of you who are able, if you want to join us again next week, uh, we're going to be talking um, in much greater depth and detail about uh, that program. Um, otherwise, if there are no questions, I think um, that's the conclusion of, of the webinar. Yes. I just want to I just want to mention three things. One is that the new 941 forms will be published by IRS. Those 941 forms for for second quarter, third quarter, and fourth quarter of 2020, they are going to be different than the first quarter of 2020. In order to accommodate both for refundable tax credit as well as refundable retention credit, and also in case of uh, in case of refundable tax credit, please remember that employers they have to they have to pick up pick that credit as in as include that in, in their gross income. And in case of refund refundable retention credit, that credit reduces the wage deduction on the tax return. Thank you. Okay. All right. Um, all right, any other uh, last comments? Um, and, and let me just, one other thing I was gonna add, um, I think I've said it a couple times, this presentation will be available um, by a, um, you know, a, a recording, um, which will be available probably starting in about 24 hours or so. So for anyone who uh, missed some or, or all the program or maybe wants to go back to a particular part, um, that should be available uh, shortly. Thanks everybody who was able to attend and uh, look forward to seeing you next week. Thanks.